One of the most groundbreaking technologies that Veeam has innovated over the years is known as our data labs. Data labs actually consists of several moving pieces that enable quite a few features within the Veeam product set. What we're gonna do in this particular video is explain that core foundational piece, which is known as the virtual lab. We'll explore all the components that make up the virtual lab, what the infrastructure is gonna look like when deployed, as well as how the data actually flows when you start the virtual lab. Keep in mind, we also have a series of videos on Veeam.com under the Learn section that will address in further detail all the other features that we've got listed here on the Lightboard. So let's draw out a quick VMware diagram and get started. Okay, now that we've finished drawing out our VMware environment, let's explore what we've got on the Lightboard. First off, we've got a basic VMware infrastructure consisting of a few VMs, a host running from shared storage, we also have our production network depicted here at the top. Down at the bottom, we've got our Veeam repository, as well as this isolated network, which we'll get into in just a moment. Now, generally speaking, in a virtual environment in vSphere, you're going to have a virtual network interface card attached to a VM or multiple VNICs, and they are responsible with providing communication and data flow to the VM from some network, right? In this case, they're gonna go through the IO stack of the host, up to what we're calling the production LAN or the production network. Let's just say this is how they get their internet connectivity for an example. Now this could also be a management network, it could be a storage network, a backup network, any type of networks that they may have, this is where the VNIC comes in in a vSphere environment. Now the way the virtual lab operates in Veeam is we're going to create an isolated fenced off network within the production infrastructure and it's kept completely isolated from production with the help of what we call a virtual appliance that acts like a proxy. So we call it our virtual proxy appliance. But essentially, all it is is a virtual machine that runs in the infrastructure that's going to federate traffic to and from this isolated bubble. We'll call this our VLAB for short. And any VM that gets turned on inside this virtual lab will not have a direct VNet connection back to production. But instead, follow me here, these VMs will go directly to this isolated network. Now, what handles all the routing of traffic? Because if this isolated network is completely detached from production, what good is it, right? There's no routing in there, there's no DHCP, there's no DNS, etc. So this Linux-based proxy appliance that we're talking about is going to have one leg in the production network as well as one leg in this isolated virtual lab network. So when you think about it, this virtual appliance is working like a router or a proxy appliance is handling network address translations. So the reason we put that in place is so that any VM that gets turned on inside the virtual lab, let's just say for an example, they're statically set they will still be able to communicate with what they think is the default gateway, which is actually going to be the virtual appliance. So think about if the default gateway was statically set on a VM and you don't actually have a connection to the production network, those VMs simply would not be able to communicate. So thanks to this virtual appliance functionality, it poses as the default gateway inside this isolated environment so that the VMs can still communicate. But because it also has a leg into production, it can choose which traffic to allow out to the real production network and which traffic to keep completely contained within this isolated bubble. So historically, when we created the virtual lab, everything was meant to be completely quarantined like a true test sandbox environment. There were ways and there are ways even now that you can grant internet access for the VMs that get turned on inside the VLAB. It is an option when you're going through the deployment of the virtual lab, but generally speaking, this is truly designed to be like a test dev infrastructure, totally isolated. Now, when we talk about how the virtual lab works, this is how the data flow works. You get it turned on, all the VMs that are running inside the VLAB only connect to this isolated network. That's the only network that they have a VNIC connection to, okay? The proxy appliance has a VNIC connection to both the isolated and production. And in fact, it can have connections to multiple networks in production if it needs to route traffic accordingly. One other thing to mention when we talk about data flow is you can set up static routes when you're going through and deploying the virtual lab. 
so that if you had someone like a SQL DBA or an exchange administrator that wanted the ability to simply RDP or remote desktop right into an instance of their virtual machine or virtual machines plural inside this test on-demand sandbox area, which we call the virtual lab, you can simply set up a static route on the production LAN that's of course not used by another device and they can use that. The proxy appliance itself will handle the routing into the virtual lab. And the way that we do that is with a concept called masqueraded IP addresses. So let's say for an example, one of these VMs was 10, 0, 0, 10 in production. That's its production IP range. A masquerade might look something like 10.0.255.10. And the idea here is this is not a routable IP address. And the only machine that is going to know this masquerade IP is in fact the Veeam backup and replication server. It's in its local route table. So if you were to give someone that masqueraded IP outside the Veeam server, it would simply go nowhere. That's where the static route comes into play. Now, when we talk about how the virtual lab can be powered, there's essentially two ways, and this is why we've got the Veeam repository drawn. The first way, and historically the way that we've had the longest, is using your Veeam backup files to drive it. And we do that through a process known as instant VM recovery. And instant VM recovery is where we can run the VM directly from the deduped and compressed backup file in a few moments and have it live ready to use in production if you had a failure. And there's another video on how instant VM recovery works on veeam.com under the learn section, but that's the first way that we can do it. And that's how sure backup works is we're going to take the VM that's deduped and compressed living on your Veeam repository and we're going to present it. Okay. Inside the virtual lab using instant VM recovery. Now, when you think about some pros and cons of this method, first and foremost, Instant VM recovery is generally not going to be as fast as production. Number one, it's compressed and deduplicated. Number two, it's coming from oftentimes slower, in some cases much slower, backup repository storage, which is designed to be super dense for long-term archiving and historical purposes versus IOP performance, right? So that's another potential challenge. Another challenge is you're going over the management network. So wherever the kernel port is inside this vSphere environment, that's how that communication will travel. Now, it will work great if you've got a few VMs inside the virtual lab and your backup repository is, say, raw disk and not a deduplication device or appliance. Now, if you're running a deduplication appliance, we recommend having an initial raw disk target first that you back up to initially. Then you can offload to the dedupe device. Certainly don't try this from most of your dedupe appliances because performance may suffer. Now the other option is if you have a SAN vendor that is supported, we actually can drive this from storage snapshots. So when you think about the supported SAN vendors that Veeam has, the list is continuing to grow due to the excellent work that our alliances team is doing with building that partnership especially now that we've opened the universal storage API that enables multiple vendors who haven't yet integrated their solutions to build the integration along with Veeam, go through quality control and make sure everything works properly. And then we simply release a plugin to support that model of SAN and vendor. Now think about the benefit if you do happen to have a supported SAN vendor, you no longer have to worry about coming from Veeam backups, which are deduped and compressed. Now you can drive this virtual lab and all, all the corresponding capabilities from a native snapshot on your storage array, which is generally going to give you much, much better performance and IOPS while you're running the VMs inside this isolated lab. Production storage versus backup storage, generally much faster. So another reason why if you do have a supported vendor from a SAN standpoint with Veeam to definitely look at Enterprise Plus. So that's a little bit about how the actual virtual lab works, how the data flow traverses, that Linux-based proxy appliance really is what makes everything possible inside the isolated lab. You can actually deploy a virtual lab across multiple hosts in our advanced multi-host deployment model if you're using distributed virtual switches within vSphere. Most times the typical deployment is the advanced single host which we'll walk through in the demo video later in the series. But make sure that if you use the simple mode, 
that the network actually configures properly and auto detects the right parameters because it's important that that Linux based appliance is set for the default gateways IP so that when those VMs come online inside that isolated lab, they know how to communicate, they reach the IP that they would otherwise be reaching out to in production. Now, one final note that I'll say on this is if you don't use static addressing, and let's say you're a customer who uses DHCP for everything, the virtual lab does support enabling DHCP. So that's another potential service that that Linux-based proxy appliance will provide inside this isolated lab is DHCP IP addressing. So hopefully this video was informative. Thank you guys so much for watching and enjoy the rest of the videos in our series along data labs and all the greatness that it can provide to assure that not only are your backups recoverable, they're verified, you have documentation that you're testing, but you can also leverage that data for many more use cases while it's otherwise just sitting dormant on your backup storage. Thanks for watching and enjoy your day.